And this was exactly what the vast majority of Russians wanted. And I would even say that today, the vast majority of Russians would like to have, if not a friendship with the United States, at least a partnership. There's no doubt to my mind that that's the case. So that was what Yeltsin wanted. And what kind of response did he get? What kind of response did Russia get? Well, the United States could have picked two ways of treating Russia. One was to say, let's treat Russia like we did our enemies after World War II. Germany, Italy, and then some of the countries that were occupied, such as France, or were not occupied, such as UK, but were really badly hurt. Let's find a way to see to it that in those countries, Nazis, fascists do not come back and communists do not come to power. And may I remind you that in those days, the Communist Party of France and the Communist Party of Italy were very, very powerful. And that plan turned out, was called later, the Marshall Plan, which was basically a financial idea to spend a lot of money, but in a very precise way, to develop certain things <clears throat> and not to allow others to develop. Now, that could be the policy to adopt vis-a-vis -vis Russia. See to it that democracy begins to develop in that country. And let me say, just for the record, Russia never, in its entire thousand years, never had democracy completely absent. So it wasn't like something that once upon a time Russians had and then they lost, but they knew what it was. They didn't know what it was. So let's spend money on getting democracy moving in Russia and seeing to it that the communists do not get back. And that could have been one approach. The other approach was to say, for 40 years, you held a nuclear bomb over our heads. You lost the Cold War, and you're going to pay for it. You're going to be punished for what you did. And there were people who supported one view and people who supported the other in this country. Early in 1992, a document was produced in the United States by a gentleman called Paul Wolfowitz. You may know who he was. He was Under Secretary of Defense of the United States, responsible for policy. The document he produced came to be called the Wolfowitz Doctrine. Not officially, but that's the way it was addressed. It later was incorporated in something that is officially called the Bush Doctrine. That document was leaked to the New York Times, and so it became public. And what it basically said, and you can look it up, it's available, you know, just go to Wolfowitz uh, Doctrine and you'll, you'll find it. What it basically said was this. The United States should never again allow any other country to challenge it. The United States must remain the superior country. And we should tell our allies not to worry about developing their own weapons, because we will do that for them. And we must watch out for Russia, because we, can't, we don't know which way it's going to go. The bear might get up on his hind legs again and growl. Um, when that document was leaked to the New York Times, it was an outcry uh, by the more liberal, if you will. In America now, the word liberal and conservative has lost the meaning that it once upon a time had. So when I say liberal, I'm not sure that um, I'm saying the right word. But at least uh, many people were upset by this document. Um, Edward Kennedy said that it was an imperialist document that no country could or should accept. It was quickly, as it were, removed and rewritten 
by um, Mr. Cheney, not a very liberal man in any sense as far as I can remember, and um, um, the uh, Secretary of Defense in those days, Mr. Powell. But basically, it retained that view. Russia and America must, remain, must be the only superpower. And basically, that view was the one that was accepted. It was the one that would accept it. And the attitude towards Russia was pretty much, you're no longer a superpower. You are a second-rate country. Just, just keep quiet, please. Uh, this became evident and would be evident to you if you follow the policy of the United States. Now, let's begin with going back to Gorbachev and his meetings when he was asked by several people, all of them quite important, to allow Germany to reunite and take down the Berlin Wall. And he was told by James Baker, and now this is it, not many people, I mean, when I would say this, many people would say, it's not true, it's not true. He was told by James Baker, if this happens, NATO will not move one inch eastward. Well, not long ago, on December 12th, 2017, the National Defense Archives of George Washington University declassified the minutes of the Baker-Gorbachev discussion, and it's there. But it's not only Baker who said that to him. There were several people who did. The German leadership did, West German at those days, and so on. And finally, I'm not say, I don't know whether, whether Gorbachev could have stopped Germany from reuniting, but the fact of the matter is that they said yes and took down the Berlin Wall. And NATO stayed put. It stayed put in those days. It stayed put under Bush Sr. It stayed put during the first four years of Clinton. But in the next four years, in 1996 approximately, a decision was taken to enlarge NATO. Three countries, Poland, the Czech Republic, and Hungary. Now, I'm going to read something to you. Uh, you know who Thomas Friedman is? New York Times, old hand uh, columnist. He, uh, when this happened, this is already 19, this is um, 1998, he called up George Kennan. I don't know if you're all aware who George Kennan was, but he was one, in my opinion, perhaps one of the most brilliant minds, political minds of the United States in the second half of the 20th century the man who devised the idea of containment of the Soviet Union rather than war against the Soviet Union, successfully did this. So, you know, a brilliant man who, uh, who established the, the, the very foundation of U.S. policy vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union. So Thomas Friedman called him up. The article he published in the New York Times is called Foreign Affairs, Now a Word from X. Why X? Because in 1947, in the magazine Foreign Affairs, um, uh, Mr. Kennan had published this article about containment, and he signed it X. So he called him up, and he asked him, what did he think about this decision to enlarge NATO? Let me quote. I think, this is May 2nd, 1998. I think... It is the beginning of a new Cold War, said Mr. Kennan from his Princeton home. I think the Russians will gradually react quite adversely, and it will affect their policies. I think it is a tragic mistake. There was no reason for this whatsoever. That decision, and now I'm giving you my opinion, is what really started this, this relation, what, 
turning it south, as you might say. That's where it all began. Because the Russian reaction, and specifically this is 1998, so uh, this is Yeltsin, late Yeltsin, was you promised not to do this. So how do we trust you if you make a promise? I would also like you to perhaps try to um, solve a little problem. It's a, a kind of a ma not, not ma mathematical. Take the time from when Gorbachev came to power, March 1985, to 2007, when Putin has been in power for seven years. That's 22 years. I ask you to find a single thing in foreign or domestic policies done by the Soviet Union, while it still existed, and then Russia proper, that might in any way anger, irk, disappoint the United States. Let me answer that for you. Nothing. Not one thing during that period. Now, what did Russia get as a result of that? First, the enlargement of NATO. So that was number one. Then the bombing of Yugoslavia that was done by NATO, and NATO is, after all, dependent mostly on the United States, let's face it, right? Uh, the UN did not condone this. So the bombing of Yugoslavia, that's uh, from March 24th, 99, to June 10th, 99. Then uh, Kosovo and recognition of Kosovo, although it had been part of Serbia for centuries, and there were people in Russia who said, you're letting the gin out of the bottle. Because if you do this, then there are other countries that will do the same. And Russia did the same, vis-a-vis -vis Abkhazia, to begin with. Okay? Uh, Yeltsin was very angry. He made a speech. He said, and of course, this is very Yeltsin-like, he said, we're not Haiti. You can't treat us like Haiti. We're a great country. We have a great past. And Russia will come back. Russia will come back. He was really, really angered. Didn't say the politically correct thing, but he spoke his mind. Uh, then finally, 2000, the year 2000, Mr. Putin is not elected, although elected, um, to the presidency. And one of the first things he does is to ask for Russia to become a member of NATO. Why not be a member of NATO? NATO was created to defend Europe, and perhaps not only Europe, from Soviet aggression from a country that you couldn't predict. There is no more Soviet Union, and there is no more Warsaw Pact. Why can't we create an organization where we're part of it, said Mr. Putin, and act together to protect from some kind of aggression? He was told, go take a walk, basically. What about some kind of partnership or becoming part of the European Union. <clears throat> Again, and this is all documented. Everything I say, except when I say my opinion, is documented. You can look it up. And he said, they were, no, you know, you're too big. Your country's too big. You can't. Uh, and all the while, Russia was being reminded that it's no longer really that important a country. Now, one of the things you must keep in mind is that much like the Americans, the Russians believe that they have a mission, that their country was selected by destiny. Now, you know, my being French, I laugh at that. I laugh both at you and at them. 
because we French know that we're the best, and we, don't, we have no, 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 we have no mission. You know, we're the, that's it. But seriously speaking, and that's a fact. And so the sense of losing this, this, this um, aura of greatness, of being told, we don't care about you. The, uh, the reaction of the average Russian to that was one of, you're, uh, you're insulting me. You, not, you don't respect me. And so the anger, gradually, and the anger focused on Gorbachev. Many, many Russians figured, you sold the country. You don't stand up to these men, to, these, to the United States. And then the same thing for Yeltsin. You'd be surprised how unpopular Gorbachev and Yeltsin are today in Russia. Maybe 5% support them, precisely for that reason. Well, there are some others as well that have to do with economic things, but nonetheless. So now here we have Putin, who, as you know, as soon as 9-11 happens, calls up Bush Jr., W, and offers his help. And yes, and does help in Afghanistan, and if you want to have your soldiers, your military people in, in Central Asia, right on our borders, be my guest. And in Georgia, absolutely. So it's not just words. You know, we, we want to fight terrorism together. And uh, gets nothing in, in, in exchange. So finally, in 2007, in Munich, um, speaking to the 20, the group of 20 in Munich, Putin says this. This is February 10th. I think it is obvious that NATO expansion does not have any relation with the modernization of the alliance itself or with ensuring security in Europe. On the contrary, it represents a serious provocation that reduces the level of mutual trust. And we have the right to ask, against whom is this expansion intended? And what happened to the assurance of our Western partners made after the dissolution of the Warsaw Pact? Where are those declarations today? No one even remembers them. But I will allow myself to remind this audience what was said. I would like to quote the speech of General Secretary Mr. Werner of Brussels on May 17, 1990. He said at the time, quote, the fact that we are not ready to place a NATO army outside of German territory gives the Soviet Union a firm security guarantee. Where are these guarantees? And do you know what the answer was? The answer was, yes, but that was guarantees given to the Soviet Union, and you're Russia. Well, what kind of a reaction would you expect? Um, last year, I think it was, making a foreign policy speech, Putin said, our mistake was that we trusted you too much, and your mistake was that you tried to take advantage of that. That is the situation today. Now, it may seem to you that I'm blaming the United States. I don't want the word blame used. It was a mistaken political decision. It was not the Russians. It was this decision that finally led to this change in Putin's attitude towards the West, and in particular, towards the United States, which is why I say how US policy created Putin the way he is today. And the really, if you will, um, um, dangerous thing is that Russian leadership, or I should be more precise and say Vladimir Putin, does not trust the West, does not trust the United States, which makes it very difficult to move away from where we are today. So that, that's something I want to underline. So we are in now in a new arms race, which is terrible. 
we are in a new Cold War, which threatens all of us. The danger of an accidental nuclear exchange has grown. We no longer seem to fear that. There used to be demonstrations. You know, get rid of nuclear weapons. That's not happening anymore. The uh, possibility of a terrorist organization somehow getting a nuclear weapon has grown. And to make it look like someone used it on each side, not the terrorists. So that, I believe, is something we should all understand. And finally, as someone who works in media, I would like to say that Russian media, uh, mainstream, I'm, I mean mainstream media, paints America black. Russian media, mainstream media, controlled directly or indirectly by the government, um, shows a, an extremely negative picture of the United States, US policy, and so on. And much to my surprise, mainstream American media does exactly the same thing vis-a-vis -vis Russia, which to me is amazing because this is supposed to be a free media as differing from the Russian one. As someone who works in Russian media, I can say it's, it's hard to call it a free media. There are some opposition newspapers and radio, but that's not mainstream. They address a very small number of people. So there we are. I think, I think people who call themselves journalists, in my book, they're, they're not journalists. But those people have played and are playing a destructive role in creating the fear, the dislike, the distrust that the people in both countries have vis-a-vis -vis each other. And the fact that we don't seem to question our media is really quite interesting. But there it is, nonetheless. We just take it. So I'd like to wind up with a quote from a gentleman, no, I hesitate to use the word gentleman, from a <clears throat> man whose name was Hermann Goering. You all know who he was? There may be some people who are too young to know. Well, he was um, Hitler's right-hand man, and he commanded the Luftwaffe, the German Air Force. And he was, of course, at Nuremberg. He was judged, sentenced to death, to hang. But he managed to get some poison, probably from the Soviets, of course, uh, since they poison people, as we know. Um, so, <laughs> so it was not to be hanged. But he was um, interviewed by an American journalist shortly before he committed suicide. And here's what he said. And I think this is something that we should all remember. Naturally, the common people don't want war, neither in Russia nor in England, nor for that matter in Germany. That is understood. But after all, it is the leaders of the country who determine the policy. And it is always a simple matter to drag the people along, whether it is the democracy or a fascist dictatorship or a parliament or a communist dictatorship. Voice or no voice, the people can always be brought to the bidding of the leaders. That is easy. All you have to do is tell them they are being attacked and denounce the peacemakers for a lack of patriotism and exposing the country to danger. It works the same in any country, said Mr. Goering. And I think he was absolutely right. And we are being led by our media, by our politicians, in that direction, in both countries. I remember an ad that I saw, a famous uh, American actor, whose name I, who, he starred in, um, Oh, gosh, so many movies. 
um, an, Afro, uh, an African American, uh, um, not a young, not not a young, yeah, free, what? Freeman. Freeman, yes, yes, and he says, "We are at war," and he does it very well. He's a wonderful actor, but he, you know, he tells you, "We are at war, and we must," and da 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 da, and of course, it's very scary. I, you know, I, there's nothing I can do about that except speak. And I speak, I'm happy to speak here today. I do this in Russia. And I'll keep doing it as long as I possibly can because there has to be some voice raised against what's happening. We're being manipulated. You know, the way Putin is portrayed, well, he's worse than Hitler. And even, even Hillary Clinton compared him to Hitler. I'm, this is, I'm not a Putin fan, believe me. But you know, what's, what's going on here? And of course, President Trump. Well, even your own press is not too, uh, not too positive about him. But anyway. So basically, that's what I wanted to share with you. And see, I've only spoken for 45 minutes. And, uh, and I would very much like to discuss. Uh, if you, I hope you have problems. And, uh, problems. Quint, uh, uh, that was a Freudian slip, wasn't it? Uh, I hope uh, you have questions. I'm sure that you know, what I've just said, in the sense of what's happened, it can't be argued about. I mean, this is, these are facts. But how you interpret them, that's a whole different issue. So. Thank you again for, for listening, and let's, let's talk.